Hello, good morning, good afternoon to our audience joining us from various time zones. Uh, I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Thank you for making the time to join us for this webinar, looking at Qatar's first legislative election set to take place on October 2nd. Uh, I want to welcome our speakers and moderator and brief, briefly introduce them here. Uh, I invite you to read their full bios on our website uh, through the link in the chat, which I'll share with you in just a couple of minutes. Um, I will start uh, with Ambassador Susan Ziade, who is a non-resident fellow at AGSIW, a Middle East strategic advisor and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Wolf School of Foreign Service. She enjoyed a 23 year career with the US uh, Department of State, where she most recently served as the acting principal deputy assistant secretary for Near Eastern Affairs and the deputy assistant secretary of state for Arabian Peninsula Affairs. She served as the U.S. Ambassador to the State of Qatar from 2012 to 2014 and uh, held senior leadership positions at U.S. embassies in Riyadh, Baghdad, uh, and Bahrain, among others. Uh, also with us is uh, Courtney Freer, who is the Provost Postdoctoral Fellow at Emory University. She served as an Assistant Professorial Research Fellow at the Middle East Center at the London School of Economics and Political Science from 2015 to 2020. She is also a non-resident fellow in the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution. Her uh, academic uh, work focuses on the domestic politics of the Gulf Arab states and Islamism. Uh, last but not least is uh, Luciana Zakara, a research assistant professor in the Gulf politics uh, in Gulf politics at the Gulf Studies Center at Qatar University. He is also a visiting assistant professor at Georgetown University in Qatar and director of the Observatory on P Politics and Elections in the Arab and Muslim World. Uh, his research interests are uh, Iranian politics and foreign policy, Gulf politics, international relations of the Gulf, and electoral systems in the Middle East and North Africa region. Moderating the session today is my colleague Kristen smith yuan the senior resident scholar at AGSIW. Her current projects concern generational change, nationalism, and the evolution of Islamism in the countries of the GCC. Her analysis of Gulf affairs has appeared in many publications, among them Foreign Affairs, Financial Times, and The Washington Post. Uh, and with that, Kristen, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Raymond. Thank you uh, to all of you for joining us. We're very excited to be able to hold this discussion um, as we look forward to Qatar's first uh, Shura Council elections, which Raymond, as you mentioned, is going to be just this Saturday in a few days um, on October 2nd. Um, the lead up to this has been, we can say, a long time in coming, and Qatar promised ever since the 2003 constitution, but frequently delayed. Uh, but here we are. Well, we're about ready to have these, these Shura Council elections now. Um, we can say the lead up also hasn't been without controversy, most notably the reaction to the publication of the electoral law in late July, which uh, where it became clear that that was going to exclude uh, most naturalized Qataris um, so that we know that the participation of the, the elections is, is somewhat limited. Uh, but still, uh, we can see that this is a, a really prominent step forward in terms of political participation. Um, these are elections, of course, to assure a council, which was once only, you know, fully appointed. So now we are having these elections. And um, also, of course, this is a big step up from the only national body before that had elections in Qatar, the municipal council. Um, we know the Shura council does have a lot more powers than, than the municipal council, which was purely advisory. This is a legislative body, which with some ability to, of course, hold uh, leadership accountable uh, in terms of uh, being able to interpolate some ministers. So we're really looking forward to this panel. I'm delighted with all the guests that we have here um, with us for this uh, short discussion. Um, I will say, too, that we have a Q&A uh, chat. We'll be um, pulling into that, I believe Raymond said, I hope that's right, that's going to be coming in the chat function, I hope I have that right. Um, so we really welcome all of you to, to send your questions and also your comments, and we especially welcome country voices um, to hear about what they have to say about these upcoming elections, just to get their, their viewpoints, uh, their concerns, what they're hoping to come from them. Um, and with that, why don't we dive right into some initial questions for the panel. Uh, I want to start with some kind of bigger, broader questions uh, that I'm going to have everybody address. And then we're going to get a little deeper into the nitty gritty sort of, of, of the elections, uh, you know, how these different districts works and the different kinds of participation and, and the powers of the council. So let me just ask you all first, um, can you tell us uh, 
really, what do you think the country gov- government is hoping to achieve in having these shore council elections? I mean, it's coming at a time where I think we can say, and to some degree, globally, democracy is kind of at a, a difficult point um, to have this kind of greater representation. And it seems Qatar is kind of moving in a, another direction. So why do you think they've um, decided to, to do this? What are they hoping to achieve from it? Um, can I start actually with um, Ambassador Zieda? Because I know I, I know that you were there in the country at the time when they were, you know, look, you know, starting to, to hold this, have this idea of having the elections. Maybe you can give us a little bit of idea of what, what you saw and what you're thinking uh, are the intent here. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on the panel today with such esteemed colleagues and my thanks to HESIW. <clears throat> The Qataris have been looking at the issue of uh, elections for the Shura Council for quite some time. Actually, the emir, uh, the father, when he was emir in 2011 at at the opening of the Shura Council, um, when I was ambassador at that time, uh, first announced that the elections would be taking place hopefully in 2013. And so there has been a long trajectory of trying to work towards these elections. And I think that in some cases, uh, well, there were sort of two basic questions. One was the internal question, uh, was the country ready for elections and what would that look like and what would that take? And as we've seen in this past period, uh, and I know my other colleagues will get into this in more detail, the question of an election law, uh, you know, who, who, who votes, uh, how it will unfold, what are the processes, uh, how are districts created, etc. All of this uh, takes a lot of time to pull together. And this was something that the Qataris knew that they would have to contend with. Also internally, was the atmosphere right for elections? And what does that mean? You know, you have to have a population that is really looking towards elections and looking towards what elections can do in terms of representing political will and the opinions and the wishes and desires of the people. And uh, if you look at 2011, at that period when Qatar was really coming into its own financially uh, on the world stage, uh, the question was, you know, are people really... uh, more content with internal issues or are they more, or do they really want to participate? So that was one thing. And then the other thing of course is the external and the kinds of, um, shall we say political winds that buffet the region and what it means in terms of uh, uh, stability in a country and stability in a region. And I think 2011, although they were announced at that time and the thinking had been by 13, they would be ready for them. We know at that point, uh, the Emir had decided to, um, uh, to abdicate his position and uh, hand it over to his son, now the current Emir, uh, Sheikh Tamim. And uh, with that uh, change, which was quite revolutionary in the Gulf, Uh, brought attention from the region and the question becomes externally, is this the right time to be taking these kinds of steps with uh, folks in the region maybe looking askance at Qatar for the steps it took? So those are just some thoughts of that period. Thank you. Um, Luciana, I know you're you're joining us from on the ground there in Doha. Maybe do you want to tell us how how you see this situation and exactly believe their hope from from these elections and and broader political participation? Well, uh, as uh, you you mentioned, this was a long time uh, uh, awaited elections, but it's true that uh, along these years that they were uh, delaying the the elections in the first announcement in the constitution in 2003, there were no many demands to to conduct these elections. Uh, Actually, after uh, 2011, when the Arab Spring shocked the whole Arab world, Qatar was one of the countries in which the Arab Spring passed without making uh, that much noise. Uh, while in other countries, they tried to rush to uh, conduct some kind of election or to increase the powers given to the elected institutions or to modif- modify some aspects of the elected institutions. Uh, Qatar did not feel the need to address this kind of demand for more political participation. Uh, or at least more representation in the uh, decision-making process, uh, because maybe the countries they felt already 
represented some of the, the existing institutions. And because mm, uh, my assumption talking to, to many, to many Qataris here is that what they see as a result of implementing in a, maybe in a rush way uh, elections in other countries in the region is instability. Uh, and um, everybody uh, assumed here that stability is something that was achieved and there is no need to change that or challenge that with something that nobody really knows how it's going to end. I mean, the examples that here always uh, are mentioned are uh, mainly uh, Bahrain and, and, and Kuwait, I'm sorry, mainly Kuwait and, and Bahrain. So these are two examples that is okay, if you have a, 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 an elected institution that instead of contributing to uh, the development of the country, uh, is contributing to instability, um, why we need to go for that? Uh, in any case, uh, the elections were, uh, were decided. Uh, I would say that at the beginning there was uh, enthusiasm about that. It's true that it's not as big as um, someone would have expected, at least as an external uh, observer. Uh, but there is some expectation that what the Shura Council, the elected Shura Council can do. I know that we are going to address this issue later, but everybody's expecting, let's see, uh, and then uh, we will perform in a way that we see the, the Shura Council is going. There was a lot of enthusiasm. The first uh, municipal election that took place in 1999, it was the first time, and the, I mean, the, the time in which the participation participation was the highest one. Well, it was never repeated again. So the initial enthusiasm of Qatar is voting in an electoral process in 1999 for the first time in, in the country attracted a lot of attention, attracted a lot of people. But then the attributions granted to the municipal councils proved to be not that important. I mean, of course, it was advisory. This is still an advisory council. The Shura Council will have much more power. According to the constitution, will have legislative uh, chamber. So the uh, Qataris, the voters are taking this much more seriously than ever before. I mean, I ask many times in all my classes about the municipal council elections to my students, and most of them, they say they never vote. I am asking now my students, and most of them, they will vote. Uh, so this gives you an idea that what is the importance that uh, at least young Qataris are given to this election compared with the municipal ones. Um, why the government decided to do it uh, now? This is a good question. I, I'm still uh, trying to figure out why now. Uh, they didn't wait until, for instance, after the, the World Cup. I assume that this is a way to show uh, that they are moving in the right uh, direction, that they want to achieve more political participation, that Qataris uh, uh, will be more involved in political affairs. Generally speaking, uh, in, to some extent in policy making in, in the country, and to provide with the citizens with avenues to channel their uh, wishes to say something. I mean, since Arab Spring, Twitter, social, all social media in general became uh, these channels of uh, uh, participation or uh, public opinion. Now they wanted to use this as a way to channel that in a one specific way. That we're going to discuss, I assume, later. Um, and they say, okay, why not? This is the right time to do it. Blockade is over. Uh, there are no many economic grievances. The crisis in uh, the COVID crisis seems to be uh, giving more relax, relaxation to, to, to the area. So why not doing it uh, now? And I assume they consider that doing it before the, the FIFA World Cup will attract more positive attention as a way to show what, what they are doing in, in uh, positive steps. Great. Well, thank you, Luciano. And yeah, definitely, I know I'm speaking with Qataris over the last decade. It, you definitely feel that ambivalence. And I mean that in the real sense of the term, torn in both directions with some very high-level Qataris telling me like, no, we don't. Why do we even need elections? It's not going to take us in a positive direction. Um, you know, culturally, it may be more, take us in a more conservative direction. Um, but yet, uh, we also had a lot of other Qataris, right, who uh, openly called for, for reforms in the country and are very, very eager to see these elections. So it will be interesting to see um, how that plays out. Courtney, what, what are your thoughts about why they're holding these elections now? I mean, I guess I'd, I'd stress, as has been mentioned, both the domestic audience and the international. So on the domestic side, 
this is really a fulfillment of something that's been in the constitution for quite some time. I mean, the Shura Council first came into power through the 1972 constitution. It has been updated in terms of its composition since that time. It was initially 20 appointed members and now uh, 45 appointed members. And then of course, 15 of the, or 30 of these will be um, elected in after, after this election. So it has changed. Um, and I think really the elections is something that has been talked about for quite some time. It's seen particularly since the 2003 referendum on the, the constitution seen as, as something that's been written in the document. So it's basically a fulfillment of, of a promise from the government and essentially it's something that's that they've intended to do for quite some time. Um, I, I do think, as Luciano mentioned, there's a lot of preparation that has to go into holding elections. And uh, so you've had CMC, a central municipal council election since 1999. So that kind of gives people, gets people used to the practice of voting, sets up districting, sets up apparatuses for voting, places for voting, things like this to kind of, you know, acclimate people to, to the idea of, of having elections, um, as well as to get some of the logistical aspects uh, worked out, I would say. Um, and, I, and I think in terms of turnout for the CMC, I had a look before um, before we started to see kind of what kind of turnout levels. And in the 2019 municipal council election, turnout was about 50%. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, with the Shura council elections. I presume it will be higher. Um, and then, so that's kind of on the domestic side, I would say it, it's really seen as a fulfillment of something that was always going to, to happen at some point. It's just been been delayed. And on the international side, of course, this is, um, you know, quite frankly, good PR ahead of the, the World Cup. I mean, it looks good, especially in a situation where there's a tightening of political restrictions really a across the world, across the Middle East in particular. It looks good to hold elections and to to, for the government to make a commitment to having more public participation in political mm -hmm. life. So I think uh, it's also in terms of timing happening before the World Cup. Um, I was looking at one uh, one campaign agenda from one individual and he actually mentioned the need to address workers' rights. Um, and so it's it shows also that, that countries are thinking about a lot of issues and are concerned about a lot of issues that have also been raised by the international community. Um, so I would say basically, you know, there are two audiences as as often is the case, um, and both will I think be happy with the fact that these elections are being held. Yeah, and that's a very interesting uh, last point that you made about what are the issues that are going to come up uh, both in the campaigns and then come up from these uh, new shore council members that are representing their different districts. What do you think, and I'll, I'll just go to you directly then, what, what do you think the impact of the council is likely to be? Um, I know we're kind of speculating at this point, but do you think it's going to have any significant impact on either, you can address either the domestic side or the, the international side of where, where Qatar, you know, stands in terms of their foreign policy? I do think it will have an impact. I mean, I think it's, it's a, it's a huge deal that it has legislative power, so it can you know, amend, approve, dismiss uh, certain bills and can do that by a two thirds vote. Um, it can also change, it has the power to change this uh, citizenship law, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that has been discussed in the run up to the elections in terms of um, which Qataris have the right to vote. Um, I would presume that there would be more focus on the on domestic policies and, and in particular in some of the agendas I've seen, there's talk about economic reform, uh, about women's rights, some, some social policy issues. Um, but I think the fact that it can you know, can legislate is is a huge qualitative shift from where it has been in the past. Also, the power to interpolate ministers um, is hugely important. And I was looking at the constitution and comparing, you know, the powers of the Shore Council to the Kuwaiti uh, Parliament because it's we constantly have these issues of, of ministers being interpolated and being removed from office. So I didn't know whether it would be similar in the in the Qatari case. Um, I mean, in both cases, a minister can be removed um, by a two thirds vote through a vote of no confidence, um, which is significant. Um, there are slightly different different rules vis-a-vis uh, -vis kind of how parliament works in Kuwait versus in Qatar. Um, and, and I think this is intentional because, you know, the Kuwaiti parliament has been seen to, to cause a lot of gridlock politically um, in domestic politics. And so I think the, the Qatari body had, certainly has enough power to block legislation as well as to, to kind of create its own agenda. Um, I think what will be interesting is to see how members work together, considering that there, there aren't political blocks in the same way that we see yeah. in Kuwait. Um, I mean, in both cases, you don't have political parties. Um, 
I mean, in Kuwait, there are these de facto political parties, I would say proto parties, essentially. Um, so, you know, coalition building within the Shura Council will be interesting to see. Um, but it, it does have uh, substantial legislative authority. So it, it's, it is not a toothless assembly um, and is, is one that, that I think is maybe, maybe second only to Kuwait's in terms of how much power it has to, to legislate when we look at GCC um, bo- uh, legislative bodies. Thank you. And I definitely am going to want to get back to you on that, because I know you're really an expert on a lot of these different political movements, both Islamic and tribal, I guess, if you want to call it a political movement, those sorts of politics, identity politics. So um, we'll want to get more into that, um, especially, you know, as we see, um, I'd say a weakening of political um, parties or societies, even societies, we don't have parties, of course, in the Gulf of political societies across the Gulf, even in Kuwait, I think there's been a weakening of that. So we'll have to see how this is structured and we'll probably get more into that. Luciano, what what do you think about uh, the impact that this will have on domestic and foreign policy? Uh, sorry, Luciano, you're muted. I knew it would happen. <laughs> I tend to agree with uh, with um, with Kearney about uh, the impact that is mentioned in the Constitution. Of course, everybody expects that this will be uh, the case in, in Qatar uh, after the Qatar elections. However, I mean, everybody is cautious about uh, claiming that actually the parliament, for instance, will be uh, interrogating uh, ministers. Uh, I mean, I asked some people, it's okay, yeah, well, they might do that, but... I mean, always the idea that this could become like Kuwait is something that uh, is making people to get uh, afraid about their role, uh, uh, the role, the individual members or groups that they can be created within the parliament uh, can have. Uh, we have to also bear in mind that uh, like uh, the Kuwaiti case, uh, there are members that they are elected and also members that they are, they, they are appointed. So it's not all the chamber that will be uh, elected. Only thirty members and fifteen will be appointed by the by the by the by the, the mayor. So meaning that It'd having majority, block, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean having majority. I mean, if there are blocks that I don't think they will, the way in which uh, the districts were defined is very difficult to get uh, one. Um, like I said line that can help them to 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 have blocks uh, politically speaking maybe about the ideas maybe about uh, some specific program maybe for instance what uh, uh, it was mentioned before the citizenship law i mean there are people that they are already saying that they want to discuss this the reform the reform of the electoral law and the citizenship law uh, and actually this is some kind of compromise that there will be discussions about these two a loss once the Shura Council has all uh, its power. And here you will see different members going on one direction or the other. But I don't see that there will be blocks pushing for one specific uh, program. Uh, here there have been debates about different uh, laws, uh, labor law, uh, the um, pension or retirement law. So these are laws that might be uh, focus of attention of the elected Shura Council. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, so far, the the, the programs of uh, the different candidates are touching different points. Some people say that environmental issues will be important, food security. Um, some are um, um, trying to push for one uh, parliament that has real powers and capacity to work. I mean, so far, there's, there's no clear whether the, 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 the Shurak will, will have its own budget to uh, designate uh, researchers that can help the members of the parliament to, to perform properly. So there is a mention of one soon, but there, there is no clarity about what you can do with that, if this is a payment for the, 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 the members of the parliament or is a budget that they can use to pay other people to do research for them. I mean, so far, the, the current uh, Shura Council has no structure, mm. uh, support the structure to, to, to help the, the, the members of the parliament to do any research, so how they will perform. If we compare uh, this Shura Council with others, we will see even in the other, uh, in the region, in, in Kuwait or in Yemen, there are a group of people that they are supporting the activities, uh, providing information, providing research, et cetera, et cetera. There are some candidates that they are talking about that, uh, that say, okay, in order to perform properly, in order to be able to produce a significant or relevant 
a legislation that can help the country, we need to have a budget, we need to have the tools to, to perform properly. Uh, so far, we don't know exactly how, how this is going to work. Uh, um, so it, it, it will all depend on how uh, this is uh, finally done. I mean, who is going to be the members? I mean, also we have to remind the candidates uh, very few have previous experience as ministers and uh, previous uh, members of the Shura Council. Uh, it's a pity that other members, I mean, the, the Shura Council has, uh, since 1972, it was created. So many members passed through uh, through the Shura Council and not many of them are, are, are running. We don't know if then some of the previous members of the Shura Council would be appointed in this within these 15 members. But it would have been interesting to have more people with experience, despite mm. the fact that of course, the role is different, but people that they have experience in discussing uh, bills or knowing how is the legislative uh, life uh, in this country to contribute with their experience. Uh, so most of the candidates are people that they are well known in the business community or in the industry, et cetera, et cetera, but very few have experience. So yeah. we don't know exactly how, how they will, how they will uh, perform. And we don't know yet who's going to win. I mean, there are districts in which it is clear who's going to win. There are other districts in which there are a lot of competition, even within members of the same family. So it all depends on how the, the pre-electoral uh, conversations, uh, discussions are taking place. Last week was the last week of uh, candidates to drop. Uh, we still have 224 candidates, if I'm not wrong. So it's a huge amount of candidates for 30 seats. Yeah, that's a great point, too, about the experience. I know we've seen uh, a trend as well in the Gulf of, of enormous turnover. I mean, if you look like at the Bahraini parliament, the turnover has been incredible. Um, so not a lot of incumbents and not that experience. You're right to work the, the process, the legislative process. So um, let me turn to you, Ambassador. Um, I wanted to ask you the same question, but also I'm especially curious if you think this will have any impact on Qatar's standing or foreign policy. Do you think that's going to affect uh, where Qatar stands on that? Yeah, uh, well, let me take a step back and, and uh, <clears throat> chime in in terms of uh, some of the things that Luciano and Courtney have said and, and with which I agree. First of all, on the question of, uh, of who can vote and who can run. Uh, as, as Courtney rightly pointed out, that's something that the Shura Council can, um, can uh, amend if it should cho so choose once they are in session. And I would point out that uh, the foreign minister, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdurrahman, in his uh, uh, presentation last week in response to a question of the Council of Foreign Relations actually stated this very clearly. So it's not just that it's embedded in, in the text of what uh, of what can take place, but actually the government has uh, formally come out and said that this is the case, which I think was an important signal from the government. So that's number one. Number two, <clears throat> I see a lot of focus on domestic issues. Uh, certainly the women are gonna be very focused on women's rights, whether it's personal status codes and other issues. And they're gonna be looking to see how they can use this body. I mean, this is my, my projection. I don't know if this is going to be true, but it would seem to me they're gonna be looking to see how they can use this body in a way to um, advance their concerns about issues that affect their everyday life. I think this is going to be important and it really builds on the progress that women in Qatar have made over the last 20 years in terms of participation, not only in society, in the workplace, you know, economic independence, but also have a voice um, in civil society, which I think will now have a new stage through the Shura Council. So I think that is very accurate. There will be people who will raise issues uh, domestically, which I think is going to be the bigger focus. Climate change is going to be a big one. Transnational issues like health, uh, this COVID, of course, was a wake up call. But even things like labor, um, you know, historically, there, the, the labor question has always been a thorn in the side of many of these GCC countries. Uh, Qatar has come under a greater microscope because of the upcoming World Cup. 
uh, and they have taken strides to address this issue and have made progress even as certified by international organizations and NGOs. However, it's always been, a, it's not there yet, and it's always been a struggle between those in the government who understand the need and want to address these and elements within the business community, like it is in any country, whether it's the US or anywhere else, where they have vested interests and are not wanting to see movement on particular economic issues. So the question will become, uh, questions like labor and, and environment and others that have a nexus with um, economic development, how will those be addressed within the Shura Council? I think people will want to raise them. The other thing is that I have seen mention that certain topics perhaps will not be taken up by the Shura Council. And those involve defense, security, uh, economics, uh, and investment strategy. So uh, my question will be uh, looking uh, going forward how do issues that have an economic component, whether it's labor or, um, or social components, but have an economic side to it, how will those will be, how they will be dealt with when they say economic issues, where is the line drawn and how much um, gray space is there around the edges that, that members of the Shura can go forward and, and, and work these issues. Uh, on the foreign policy side, um, I think really, it, I think domestic issues are going to uh, be the focus of the Shura Council by and large. I know that in Qatar, the foreign policy issues have taken a much bigger space in the minds of Qataris, uh, not only since the embargo in 2017, but I would even take it back to um, 2014 in March. Uh, and I was ambassador at the time when uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain pulled its ambassadors out of Qatar over differences on domestic and foreign policy issues. Um, the Qataris started to understand that while in the past they had really paid scant attention to where Qatar was, uh, going in terms of foreign policy and, and actually in many cases took pride in what Qatar was doing in its mediation role in disputes in many parts of the world in their humanitarian work uh, uh, across the region, um, whether it's through education or healthcare or, or governmental assistance to a broad range of, of Muslim countries. Uh, that certain actions that the Qataris had taken were now seen to be inimical to GCC solidarity. And what did that mean? So you started to see more interest in foreign policy issues. And certainly um, the, the blockade, the embargo, whatever you want to call it, the blockade, uh, brought this question to the fore. I think that this uh, issue of watching how the Qatari government nimbly, um, adeptly uh, handled that uh, blockade, and even though it was very difficult, was able to come out on top, uh, were able to manage it economically, were able to manage it uh, politically, uh, diplomatically, um, and in a way that really, enabled them to find their own lane and continue marching forward, it gave the people uh, not only a real confidence in the government, but a real solidarity and support to the Emir of Qatar and to the Council of Ministers who had worked these very thorny issues. So I think that while they will be looking at foreign policy issues, they have a newfound um, uh, confidence and, and, and respect for uh, the way the, the blockade was handled by the government and by the leadership and certainly under the leadership of the Emir uh, Sheikh Tamim. And that uh, they will want to look at these issues going forward, but I think that domestically will be a, um, the focus on domestic issues will be probably more, um, more important in their minds in the short term at least in the immediate term. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
So a, a couple points come up here. I mean, I mean one, uh, obviously, as we heard, I mean, you said there's kind of, it will, will be interesting to see these gray lines around these top level issues, defense, economic, security. Um, those are big issues, obviously. We would normally, I guess, at least from a Western perspective, would be very interested, the parliament, in, in doing that. But we do know across the Gulf that there has been some sort of understanding or limits about what... Um, even elected bodies in other countries can really address in terms of foreign policy and that it is kind of usually a little bit more of a, a red line. So it'll be interesting to see that moving forward. Um, and that kind of brings us to the question of the actual powers of the Shura Council. Um, I mean, I, for instance, I know when they when they have the, um, when they can interpolate ministers, some of these sovereign ministries are, are I believe are offline, right? For interpolation, you can't actually interpolate all of them. So um, I, I wanted to turn to you, Luciano, maybe if you can just tell us a bit more about the powers of the Shura Council and how they compare maybe to other, you know, examples that we would know or to uh, regional, you know, elected bodies. Um, and, I, and I'll ask uh, just, and I think it is confusing. We have a question in the Q&A, and this is also a chance to encourage all of you, go ahead and start putting your, your questions into the Q&A box from Harry Hagopian. The speakers are talking about the Shura Council as a legislative body that enacts bills in the Western sense, whereas a Shura Council is a consultative or advisory body. Um, so in which mind, which is it? Is it an advisory body or does it is it actually a legislative body? So maybe you can address that, Luciano. Well, in, in, in paper, in the Constitution, actually, the, the, the Qatar Constitution says that the, the elected Shura Council will have a, a legislative power. And then how this is going to work, this is uh, the big incognita. Uh, for instance, what the Ambassador Siade said, which areas will not be able to, to, to discuss about? Uh, I mean, in any case, I mean, the Shura Council... Uh, the current Shura Council is discussing the laws, that the bills that they are sent by, by, by the government to approve them. So in this case, the, council, the, the Shura Council will be able to, uh, to initiate legislation, which is something that is new in the, in the history of Qatar. Before we were signed, just uh, signing or approving, or in some cases discussing, I mean, what it was said is that non, in not many occasions, the Shura Council was really discussing uh, the laws, just approving them. But there are few cases in which there were uh, uh, discussions. I mean, the retirement law took a lot of uh, months to, to be approved by the Shura Council. So I assume that some areas, and I agree with the uh, Ambassador Siade, that many things that they had to do with, inter with internal issues will be uh, discussed. Uh, the problem is, who sets the limits of the topics and how the limits will be set if in this constitution it's not, uh, it's not mentioned. Uh, or, for instance, which minister would be interrogated or, 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 or grilled like uh, they, they, they do in, uh, in, in Kuwait. I mean, again, this has to do with the way in which uh, how the members of the Shura Council perceive their own role or their, their capacity to, to oppose or to exert some kind of... Uh, uh, oversight uh, role uh, of the of the um, of the government. So far, I don't think the neither the, the the candidates nor the members of the current Shura Council consider that this is a proper role of the of the Shura Council to control what the government does or to criticize, let's say, so, or, or to to question uh, the government. Generally speaking, they consider that the government is doing a, a good job. That their what they can do is to contribute to legislate or to produce some uh, new legislation that is contributing to, to the country. But they don't perceive the role as one of the roles that the Shura Council should have or any legislative power in, in the world should have, which is controlling or requesting the government to be uh, accountable. I mean, be making the government accountable. I, I don't think that we are in the, in the situation to say that uh, the Shura Council will not it's not written in the constitution is because they will not do it uh, I, I don't think they they feel that they are in that in that uh, uh, situation and compared with other uh, other mainly GCC states uh, Kuwait of course has uh, the biggest attribution it's the only country in the GCC in which the Shura Council or National Assembly in that case has the attribution to uh, determine the succession or to influence in the succession mm. of the monarchy this is not granted in any other of the five GCC states. So 
Uh, we cannot expect that this is uh, done uh, in, in Qatar. Because simply the kind of political system is different than, than Kuwait. Uh, Kuwait, the beginning of the, the history, political history of uh, Kuwait is different and the relation between the merchant class and the different tribes and the ruling monarchy is different than, than here in Qatar. So uh, I don't think that the, the, the council will have any attribution in determining the composition of the government influencing any, any, any kind of, uh, I mean, of the formation of the cabinet. Uh, but again, it will be, it will, we will see how, how they perform this for first four years. Nobody knows exactly uh, what they're going to do because nobody knows exactly what, what are the real expectations of their performance. Thank you. I'm sorry if I, I cannot be more, more clear, but uh, yeah. there are a lot of incognitas about that. And we will see yeah. as, as soon as we see the composition and, and the people start to assume office. I mean, as I mentioned before, if they don't know exactly how they're going to work because they don't know if they have a budget to, to function, yeah. how they're going to perform properly. Well, let's get a bit more into the, the organization of the elections. Uh, we know that there has been a lot of controversy over who can participate over the districting. Um, I know Luciano, you may have some things to say about that as well, but I, I thought I, I'd turn to Courtney. Um, we know that you're an expert both on, I mean, on many things around the Gulf, but especially also on political movements, Islamic movements, um, tribal politics, which has come up a lot um, within this election. So maybe if you can respond a bit to, to that issue. Sure. Yeah. Just um, in terms of what the rules are. Um, so as, as has been mentioned, there are 45 members of the Shura Council. 30 will be elected. 15 will be appointed by the Emir. The 30 will be elected from 30 different districts within Qatar. So one representative from each of the 30. In some of the districts, as Luciano mentioned, people are running unopposed. So there's different levels of competition at, at each. Um, and Qatari citizens over the age of 18 can vote. The issue, of course, has been, you know, what who counts as a as a Qatari national, and so this is the the, the thing that has has come up is essentially, you know, whether naturalized Qataris will be allowed to vote, and so essentially the the current nationality law, which has the protection of constitution and therefore according to the constitution can only be changed through the Shura Council, um, says that uh, Qatari nationals, original Qatari citizens are those um, who settled in Qatar before 1930, who had paternal grandfathers in Qatar, um, essentially. So this is the, the law that, that caused a lot of uh, conflagration, especially with members of the Almora tribe, who uh, many of whom were not are, are, you know, excluded on the basis of that law. Um, there have I know that there I, there have been some changes made. I mean, I know that there have been meetings with members of the Almora tribe about kind of um, you know moving forward with this and and giving them uh, and and the possibility for for change in the future. Um, and and kind of the protests have have stopped and and all of this. But in terms of how tribal politics will affect things moving forward. I think that one thing that happens when you don't have political parties, um, which is the case throughout the, the GCC, um, is that people sometimes will tend to vote for people they know uh, or for members of family or members of tribe. Um, and so I know that in terms of the districting, um, people are supposed to vote in the district where they're from, not necessarily the district in which they reside. Um, and there's been some discussion, some back and forth, and, and certainly we can, we can debate it here as well, about whether this strengthens the power of tribal ties or whether it actually diminishes them. Um, but in any case, that's that's the rule. Um, and looking at kind of how how the power that you know tribal identity has in mobilizing voters, um, there's some some data from from Cesri, which is based at Qatar University, and found that in terms of voters for the municipal council, 14% um, of people surveyed said they voted due to a relationship with the candidate. So there is this idea that personal ties may matter. I mean, 14% is not huge. Um, there was another study. Um, of voters in the uh, advisory council in the UAE in 2015 that said that 47% of the voters said that they had personal knowledge of or a relationship with the person they voted for. So I think there is sometimes this tendency, especially when there aren't um, blocks organized on the basis of political ideology to vote for people you know, or to vote for members of, of the same tribe. Um, and certainly with, with all of, a lot of discussion surrounding um, the participation of the Almora tribe and, and of other tribes, this has, has brought this to the fore once again. Um, 
and I'd be curious to hear kind of other other people's opinions on on how the districting may affect this. Um, and of course, it's something we we will, will only know after after the election takes place. Um, but that's the, kind of the basic organization, as I understand it. Yeah, and I think you're right, Courtney. I mean, it's it's pretty clear. I mean, having 30 districts, a large number of districts, only one representative per district, one one vote. Uh, we know just from our experience, like with Kuwait politics and stuff, that will make it very difficult, I would think, to have much more broader national issue based politics. Um, so it is in a way built into the structure of the elections, I would think, um, in addition to, as you said, not having political parties. Um, so it kind of pulls the elections down to this kind of a little bit more personal. And I think, as, as the ambassador said, uh, kind of very uh, home politics about how it affects people kind of personally instead of broader political movements. I don't know if you want to say something about that, Luciano, just because I know you're um, an expert on kind of comparative yeah. elections. Um, yeah, I mean, I wanted to, to, to point out something that uh, Carney mentioned. I mean, the controversy about the law, I mean, I, I, actually the, 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 controver the controversy was not about the electoral law, it was about the citizenship law. Uh, actually, the electoral law is not as restrictive as uh, it is the citizenship. I mean, the problem was the problem emanated in the 2005, uh, um, which is actually the second citizenship law, the first one in 1961. The second in 2005 was much more restrictive in defining who is a Qatari. And which are the, uh, actually not in that aspect, but in the aspect that the, um, the people that they are not or they're naturalized, they cannot vote. I mean, and this was clear in that, in that uh, uh, and this second uh, citizenship law. The problem is, since there were no legislative elections, there was no need to address that issue. I mean, this was the only practical uh, difference that differentiated um, uh, Qataris and naturalized, that the naturalized citizens were not able to vote. The problem is how to define who was Qatari and who, uh, I mean, who, who entered in that definition of Qatari that is able to vote and Qatari that is not able to vote. Actually, this the electoral law did not go to the definition of being in Qatar before 1930, but to the grandfather being Qatari, which is actually broadening the, the, the spectrum of people that they really can vote. So it's, it's not as restrictive as it was in 2005. The problem is it raised the problem that already existed in the 2005 law that never, uh, I mean, it did not create a problem because there was no opportunity to demonstrate anything. Uh, I mean, the other uh, uh, practical effects, there is no difference between naturalized and not naturalized categories. So this is the only case in which you could see uh, some difference. Again, um, this, uh, the electoral law is less restrictive. So it's actually allowing more people to vote compared with uh, it could have been if the citizenship law was applied as the only criteria to define who can vote, uh, who couldn't. Uh, if I can mention something about the district in districts uh, that was also mentioned, or if you want me to... to uh, go ahead, briefly. I, yeah. I just noticed, by the way, and I apologize, I, I was looking at the Q&A function and more people have been posting in chat, so I do want to bring some of that on board. But if you want to quickly say something, would you? Yeah. I mean, uh, actually... I mean, I know, I know they have been discussing the, the, how to define the district since a long time ago. I had a conversation in 2016 in which they, they already told me that they had headaches defining uh, how to do it and not to follow the same geographical distribution that uh, the municipal council used. I mean, the municipal council is formed by 29 members and they are distributed geographically. There was some uh, changes in the district the borders in 2016. Uh, 14 for the 2015 elections, but after that, they keep this uh, distribution. Uh, decided to put this one because it's different than the municipal one. It has a lot of power and actually is the representation of all the people, all the Qatari people in the most important and um, uh, representative institution in the country. So they wanted to be very careful about everybody being represented, all the tribes being represented. Of course, you don't have 30 tribes in Qatar, you have much more, and in some districts, you have many tribes that they are represented. So, no, I mean, it's very difficult to please all the all, all the all the tribal groups or all the families that they they consider themselves as one different tribe compared with the comparing with the big tribe. 
uh, there is no other way once you decided to go for this tribal uh, distribution to please all the tribal groups. Uh, but of course, it creates in, uh, differences between the tribes that they have much more uh, members compared with the tribes that they are less. But also in multi-tribal districts, uh, this will uh, contribute to, uh, um, I mean, diminish the tribal character of the election. So the tribal character of the election will be very visible in some of the districts, in other districts, maybe not. Maybe the, the, the people will vote along tribal lines, but maybe the fact that you have 10 candidates from different tribes will contribute to the people to, in this district to vote not following tribal lines, but to follow or to, to, to follow uh, the best candidate, the best possible candidate or the most qualified one. In the districts in which you have only two or three candidates from the same uh, family or the same tribe, of course, there is no other way to vote someone outside the, uh, the family because there are no members of other tribes residing in this district. So, I mean, this is uh, addressing what, what Kearney mentioned, that whether this will reinforce tribalism or not, I mean, it's still difficult to, to know, to see the patterns of uh, voting uh, in every district will be different because you see the patterns of uh, candidacy that is different. In some cases you have one, in some cases you have 21. So it's, it's, uh, it's complicated. I mean, we okay. need to explore the, 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 yeah. the results. That's probably a lot of detail that we'll see going forward. Um, I did want to bring in, um, I, I have a comment from uh, Miriam al Khajri, who is a PhD student in sociology at uh, Edinburgh in his country. Um, and, and I think uh, I want to commend to you, actually, I don't have the, the citation here, but she wrote a very interesting piece, um, basically arguing about, you know, the, the construction that allowed for it to be kind of a focus on, on tribes and how that kind of works against a broader more democratic kind of inclusion and national inclusion within country politics, which I would commend to you her piece. Um, she makes a point, I think it's important to, to bring in here. She says, there's no equal power relations. Countries are aware that public criticism would mean losing their jobs or citizenship. Um, and, and, and she mentioned, you know, which is an important point I think to, to bring out here. Um, she also says that the government is taking the step, not as she thinks the reason that they're doing it um, is, is not because it wants democracy and public participation. And, and she thinks this is shown through the electoral laws and then the way that that was carried out, I, I imagine. And, and again, the restriction of the, the participation, um, but that their main target is the international audience um, and looking different from surrounding countries. Um, so I did want to include her, her comments and thoughts on this. Um, Susan, did you want to say anything more about that? I know we're running out of time, actually. Um, I'll allow you to, to comment on the, that broader context or, or also address the issue about how we think the elections will affect um, kind of broader regional dynamics, especially with the neighboring states, if you think that will, will be impacted there. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, on, on the first issue of sort of uh, looking for international acclaim, look, you know, you're sort of damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So I sometimes have a little bit of difficulty with that kind of comment only in the sense that, you know, uh, you're, you can be seen as in a no-win no situation. I do think that the Qatari see themselves as having braved this blockade coming into a new era. They have the World Cup uh, that will place them uh, on the international stage once again. They have had success in uh, helping mediate the whole situation in Afghanistan and see themselves as having a very important role uh, that can help facilitate uh, future discussions, uh, whether it's with the Taliban or how uh, things unfold from a security and regional uh, security perspective in the region. And that has an impact for all uh, international powers. Um, and, and so they have other successes that they're looking to see, how, you know, how do we enhance our position on the world stage? Because that's also part of their security, how they build alliances, how they build relationships. They had done that very successfully in, in the late 2000s. Uh, um, things had uh, changed uh, in the early years uh, 
uh, when uh, the Sheikh Tamim was coming into power and finding his way. And then of course, with the blockade, it all came to a pretty big halt. But they're, they're resurrecting that role uh, in a way that has proved very successful. And they're resurrecting it in a way that has built strong alliances with important partners, both in the East and in the West. So I think that that will continue and that that's not something to be, um, to be minimized. But they're not doing it simply for that reason. It's because that has always been part of Qatar's strategy in terms of being a small country in a big region with big, powerful neighbors. So that's a continuation. It just ebbs and flows and we're on the upside trajectory. In terms of the region, I think that uh, in many ways, the Qataris, uh, and I'm only speculating, I don't know, may have been um, uh, hesitant to take certain steps. Well, in part, because as uh, Luciano and, and uh, Courtney have said, the, the actual mechanisms that need to be put into place to determine how these elections would unfold took a long time. And I, I heard this from a lot of people, even when I was in Qatar in 2014, you know, uh, the whole issue of the districting and keeping the families and the tribes intact and making people feel that they're really part of the political process and that they have, um, uh, you know, skin in the game, which was very important for, for the government and for the leadership. But in addition, you know, there had to be a sense of how much would the traffic bear and where are they going to choose their battles in terms of, of the neighbors? Uh, you know, they weren't worried about Oman. They weren't worried about Kuwait. I mean, Bahrain has had a thorny, thorny relationship with them, but certainly not over this issue of a legislative council because Bahrain has had a raucous parliament for, for quite some time and have had elections. So the Bahrainis had, had nothing on the Qataris from that. But it was always the UAE and in particular Saudi Arabia. And for the Qataris, the relationship with Saudi Arabia has always been, uh, I would argue, perhaps the most important because culturally they're the closest to the Saudis, the families are intermarried, they're, they're both of a Wahhabi origin, the conservatism is a streak, of course, much more so in Saudi Arabia than in Qatar, but those linkages cannot be minimized uh, in terms of how one moves forward. That said, uh, the Qataris would always make their decisions based upon their own national interests. The only thing is that one would always have to weigh what are the decisions you're going to take domestically and internationally? How much will the traffic bear in the region? And how are you going to work to be able to find your way given the cross currents and the buffeting winds that could uh, be uh, the result of the decisions that you take? And I do think that the, um, the successful navigating of the blockade really positioned uh, Qatar in a way to take this position uh, and take this step uh, at a time where uh, not only because they felt it was right for their, for their country and in keeping with maybe uh, in keeping with where they wanted to go as a country, but also that they could bear the cross currents and the winds. And we'll see how that may have an impact in terms of uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, where it moves forward in terms of its political participation of its population. Thank you. Um, we're at the end of our, um, what we said we would do a one hour program. I'm gonna use an executive decision unless Raymond jumps in, which you may to tell me, just to, to take a little bit of extra time to address some of these uh, questions and comments that came into the chat. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't get to these sooner. Um, I want to add just a bit of uh, skepticism from uh, Ken Katzman. Uh, he says, the Shura Council is going to take initiative on changing the citizenship laws. Are you serious? Any change that's going to come from the, not the council. Um, and that is true that a lot of these uh, uh, sensitive issues, we've seen this even in Kuwait, where you have a lot more power, often the, there is, you know, some ability, still quite a bit of ability that's held uh, by the top to, to kind of drive issues. But we will see. 
Um, a quick question, maybe if someone wants to address it, they said the Emir will retain a veto power on shore decisions. Is that correct? Um, do you know, Luciano? I believe it. that's correct. Um, yeah, I assume, I assume uh, it is in correct. In terms of yeah. uh, getting the two I mean, the, how is the legislative process? Yes, I mean, the final say uh, will be the, the Emir. I mean, I don't, I, I don't have a doubt about that. Uh, if they can discuss the citizenship law, I mean, I, this is what the rumor is uh, going around. That uh, I mean, as it is mentioned in the law, the, this law can be only uh, reformed by the Shura Council. Uh, so it, it is in the instructions of the how, how does it work? Whether they will change it in a drastic way, this is something that maybe is part of the negotiation between the, the members of the Shura Council. We have to bear in mind that. Not everybody is interested in changing that law. Uh, there are certain groups that they want to change that law, but others, they are okay. So even if there's a discussion, doesn't mean that the law will change drastically uh, the, the criteria to define who is uh, a Qatari. Most of the people I talk to, they are okay with that law. Um, simply, So I, I, don't, I don't see why they, why they will reform it. I have another question. I'd just be curious, and I think actually this might go to you again, no, Luciano, but um, a lot of people want to know sort of on the ground what, what it's like, how have the elections been presented? This is Eleanor Gillespie asking. Thank you for joining. How have the elections been presented, marketed to the people as part of their duty to go and vote? Um, or is there a little pressure? Um, that's a good question because I know that, as you said, with the municipal council elections, when participation started to drop off, there was definitely a, an actual government campaign to get people to vote. So that's a good question. Uh, I think somebody else asked, uh, sorry, just one other question like that about... Sorry, just one second. Uh, well, I'm not coming up with it, but I think there was uh, another question. Oh, here's another one. Is the media giving a lot of space to the coverage of the campaign? Are they presenting candidates and their programs? And, and just, again, the idea of the sort of campaign, how the campaign is, is looking. And this is from Benjamin Bart. And what are the main themes? So I think that was addressed a bit earlier. But if, uh, I don't know, Luciano, if I want to turn to you and, and or Courtney, do you have something on that as well? I mean, uh all the candidates were given a, a specific uh, times in the Qatar TV, uh, but they were following some specific questions. So, who are you? I mean, introducing the, uh, your, uh, them themselves, explaining which are the main ideas. I don't remember exactly what was the time frame, but they were, they were 220. Uh, so, they were all given the same uh, amount of space to, to, to say what they, they wanted. And then it depends on, I mean, there were people that they were much more active in social media. Uh, posting videos, explaining what they wanted to do, participating in some debates, opening spaces to debate on, on Twitter. Uh, but not everybody did uh, the same. What everybody's complaining about is was the only, there were only two weeks of campaign. So this uh, minimized the capacity of the candidates to do more. Uh, and moreover, having the restriction of COVID that the big gatherings are still not uh, allowed. Uh, so you didn't have, uh, I mean, like in Kuwait, that you have big gatherings of people uh, joining. I mean, there were discussion in uh, smash lists, uh, particular mass lists of uh, people that they, they had the chance to, to gather with uh, with members mainly of the, the families, but uh, not as big. I mean, we, we didn't see any massive uh, uh, gathering with uh, with with candidates in, in any case. Uh, the thing, the themes, as I, I said before, there is a variety of topics. I mean, nobody really exactly knows what they can do or which are the main topics. I mean, some people are more interested in in, uh, uh, in discussing health issues. Other people is related interested in in, in working more on workers, labor uh, rights. Other people are, are are talking about environmental issues. I mean, environmental issues is something that pop in several uh, discussions. Uh, as ambassadors said, said, not many things were, I, I, I don't recall anybody talking about foreign policy, for instance. Uh, so basically all, all the main things that you can, you can find out uh, making a search on, on Twitter are things that they are related to internal, internal uh, politics. But again, I mean, it was a very short, I mean, honestly speaking, very short campaign and not much time to focus on 
on 200 candidates. So, I mean, um, unfortunately, we will have to pay attention to what happened in these last two weeks after the elections take place uh, to, to compile all, all the information. Uh, I mean, it's a long term of uh, a long process of doing research to, to, to get the conclusion. Interestingly enough, you know, I was speaking to a, a Kuwaiti and he, he told me that um, he knows of, of some of the countries running for short council elections have kept, contacted the people in charge of um, some of the Kuwaiti elections, basically, you know, as hired consultants. So maybe we'll start to see some more uh, professionalized uh, campaigning. When I say professionalized, actually, it's professionalized Kuwait, uh, campaigning if you see in Kuwait. Um, enter into the country space over time. So I, I thought that was super, super interesting. In the municipal elections, in the municipal elections here in Qatar, the people that started to get uh, the biggest amount of votes were the people that they were much more active in social media and they were able to to use the social media uh, to 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 advertise what they were doing. So uh, I assume that the professionalization of the of the candidates will be something uh, necessary at some point. Yeah, just a couple other points. I don't want to go run too much over. Um, we had a question from Nizar Hilal, who's a PhD student at the Gulf Studies Center. Um, he wants to make the comment that the elections come with a heavy social cost by excluding the Moro tribe. At least we know some of them have been excluded. And we should say it's not exclusively the Moro tribe that's been excluded, right? I mean, the nationality um, law does... Uh, linked with the electoral law does affect a, a broader section of the population. I've heard as much as we don't know, and uh, you know, the numbers aren't available as far as I know, but I've heard that as much of 50% of uh, country citizens could be, could be impacted by that. And it's obviously a small uh, number of people um, because of their being naturalized citizens. But anyway, they're wondering uh, if this could be exploited negatively by, by neighbors in the region. Um, I guess that is a question that we've seen before. Um, and also an interesting question that we'll just have to, I think, probably have to see moving forward, uh, wondering at how these elections will contribute to a growing kind of political culture in Qatar. Um, let me see. There's another question. Uh, 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 I think those are a bit too narrow to address right at the end, and I apologize for that, but you can definitely look at these um, afterwards. Um, let me just see. There's a lot of tribal questions uh, and how that works out with elections, which I, I think we've gone pretty in depth in that. Um, and, you know, hopefully um, a lot of these things, I think we're just going to have to see sort of as they as they play out. So why don't I just um, I think probably it's a good time just to sort of close. I, I wanted to get one last thought from from each of you. Um, you know, reaction to anything that you've heard that, you know, you had a point that you wanted to bring up uh, or just a, a general sense about how you think this will kind of uh, work, having this extra countries involved in, in, in the elections, if you have any closing comments on that. So um, let me start with you, uh, Luciano. Okay, well, first of all, of, of course, it, it will contribute to, to enhance the, the participation, of course, from not voting to voting is something uh, and to vote in for something like uh, the Shura Council is very important, and of course this will contribute to 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 create more political culture, mainly among young people that they were participating through other avenues and they wanted to do something like that. So I think this will definitely represent a, a big step uh, forward. Of course, there are people that they are not participating in, in in this, as you mentioned before, because of the restrictions of the law. We will see the numbers. Uh, after the election, because we we don't know still uh, we don't know yet how many people is eligible to vote. Uh, so we will see the numbers uh, once they are done. But I think it's a good uh, it's a good step uh, forward. Uh, we'll see how how this evolves. Uh, Courtney, I'll turn to you. Any final comments, or if you've seen anything in the chat that you you'd like to address, I'll leave it open to that as well. Yeah, I mean, just on the point of kind of political culture and and how things are working on the ground. I mean, though I'm not in Qatar, I mean, I've, I've read that also the government has has given spaces like gymnasiums and things like this for spaces for campaigning. So I think there is a very self-conscious desire to, to foster a certain change in political culture and to have more involvement, which is is important. Um, and, and looking at the document constitution, 
you know, in terms of what's written there, there is a good bit of authority given to to the Shura Council, but you know, time will tell the extent to which the the letter of the law is followed. But it is significant. I mean, that the Constitution was written in the way that it was written, um, and and I guess one thing that that we'll we'll see moving forward is kind of the extent to which tribal connections do matter, or not just tribal, but also you know, large family connections. You know, if people vote for people they know, um, and then also is that necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of interesting discussions to have moving forward. Um, and also, I think I'll be interested to see how informal campaigning has worked, because I know in Kuwait, um, you know, especially among tribes, there's a lot of informal um, and increasingly formed actually a uh, thing that happens. But I think um, over it's an exciting step. looking forward to see what happens on Saturday. Ambassador, we'll give you the, the last word. Well, I, I want to emphasize the evolution in political culture. As my two colleagues said, I think you can't say enough about the fact that, you know, we, we in the U.S. and in other cultures, we, we take a lot of this for granted. It's sort of in our mother's milk. And this is something that's new. And it is, uh, an, uh, it is a development that has to take into consideration the culture of the place in which it's unfolding. And so I think, you know, the fact that you, you don't see uh, political campaigning parties, platforms quite in the way that you might in the West, you don't see a sort of head to head, toe to toe knockout between uh, two rival candidates. This is not the, the culture of, of Qatar or even of the Gulf in general. And so that uh, how, um, uh, members of Ashura Council evolve in terms of even how they're elected. It may be more tribal to begin with. It may be more older. They, they may look to candidates. I noticed in one district, there's only one candidate. He's a former minister who's highly respected. That, that can be something that changes over time, where as younger people come in, start to get more experience, that even the composition changes and the way people look at candidates in their district can change. And then, of course, how it works uh, as a Shura. I agree with Ken Katzman that, you know, you don't expect a Shura to turn around and just change laws on a dime. It's an evolutionary process. And the Amir will of course continue to um, retain uh, his, his traditional position and will continue to exercise his authority. But the fact that you have a political culture emerging that uh, the council of ministers will have to work more closely with an elected body, I think is a positive development for Qatar and will uh, be a positive development for the people as they start to participate and take their rightful role in society as, as citizens that have a role to play and not just citizens who expect certain things from their government. It's more of a, of a give and take, a symbiotic relationship that would serve any country. So I think it's a positive step. Well, great. Well, thank you. I, I'm thrilled that we were able to have all of you um, I thank you very much, all of you who have attended for your, your engagement. Um, and I think we're all just looking forward to see sort of how this goes and how this develops. Um, I want to turn, uh, Raymond, if you're still on, I wanted to allow you to come back uh, and also to issue your thanks. And if you have any final comments or thoughts about maybe things coming up at AGSIW. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, uh, add my thanks to, to yours, to our uh, speakers who did uh, an amazing job um, uh, laying kind of what uh, the issues are and what to look forward to in, in a few days. Um, nothing much more to add than that. I uh, just want to let everyone know that, uh, as again, this was recorded. We'll have the video recording in the next couple of days. We'll make sure to send it around to all participants um, and, and our, our mailing list. Uh, if you are not on our mailing list, I uh, invite you to visit our website, agsiw.org. I'll look at what's coming up as well. Sign up to our uh, mailing list, uh, which comes through every Monday with uh, incisive analysis and interesting programs. Thank you all again for joining us and look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.